Sorry about that. Um, so, uh, raised in Six Nations, the Grand River Reserve, the Hentagelo developed a strong passion for the outdoors, including hunting, fishing, and camping. Hentagelo's personal connection to the environment, cultural upbringing, and strong education background has led him to his current position of ecotourism coordinator at Guyana Se, an ecological restoration company located at Six Nations. His primary goal being the development and growth of the eco and cultural tourism initiative of Guyana Se in the Six Nations community. Guyana De Gelo studied at Sir Sanford Fleming College in Fish and Wildlife and graduated as an environmental technologist in 2014. His work experiences includes working with First Nations and non-Indigenous consultants in the environmental field, ecological restoration, habitat restoration, teaching, facilitating camps, and educating others about ecology. So please welcome Kenta Gelo here. So are there, there are some interesting relationships that um, occur in the river and um, I've included a few videos just because it's, it's easier to, to watch it and, and see it. So this is the um, great lampasols, a type of um, mussel that occurs in the Grand River. And this um, sort of shows how they, um, they spread or they... they um, uh, again, this is uh, Mackenzie Creek. Um, so I mentioned that it's a nice example of um, a naturalized section of stream. Um, and it's a good snapshot of the Carolinian forest in Six Nations. I 
again here are the things that I mentioned earlier. Um, the Grand River watershed take, is a, takes up an area over 68,000 square kilometers. There are around 80 species of fish in the, in the river and 34 species of mussel. Uh, the length of the river is around 280 kilometers. And like I said, there are just, around, just under 1 million people living in the Grand River watershed. So, as I had mentioned, the wavy rate plant mussel is a uh, native mussel in the Grand River. This um, video is not um, in the Grand River, but it's an example of how these mussels um, mimic bait fish to um, sort of attract predatory bass to come and feed. Um, when the bass comes in to feed, it shoots the baby clams into the, or uh, mussels into the fish's mouth and they, well, I'll show you. They latch onto the gills. Hopefully this works. In the streams of Missouri lives the Lampsilis mussel, a simple animal with an extraordinary life cycle. To reach adulthood, its young must spend part of their lives inside a fish, the largemouth bass. To get there, the mussels must make physical contact, a difficult task, as mussels don't swim. But the bass has a weakness. It's a voracious predator of small fish, particularly darters. Even the slightest wriggle of a darter's tail will attract bass. Believe it or not, the fish on the mussel is an imitation, a perfect replica that will lure bass within striking range. The mussel can somehow sense approaching fish and wriggles its lure faster to entice them. If it gets the twitching just right, the remarkable likeness should do the rest. its young into the bass's mouth. These snap shut on the gills like spring-loaded traps. Here they stay, drawing blood from the fish until several weeks later they drop off as tiny, fully formed muscles. extirpated from the Grand River, but it did at one time occur here. And so this, this um, has another relationship with bait fish, um, and you'll see in a second uh, what, how these mussels um, spread their young using fish, small bait fish. This is a log perch, and you see it captures the log perch on the mouth, it actually catches it, and then it inoculates it with the, with the baby clams or the baby mussels. So these mussels, they don't have brains, right? They don't, they don't have a brain like we do. They don't really have eyes. They can sense um, low and high levels of light. Um, so like, how did they figure out to, to do all these things, to actually mimic a fish to mark, down to the markings? Different type of intelligence, I guess. But, uh, these mussels are also a, a part of the, the diet of um, Mongolian people who live along the river at certain at 
and so history. So in a lot of the um, archaeological, um, in some of the archaeological surveys, they found the mussels to be part of the diet. Uh, so the other, <coughs> so the, the mussels and, and other um, aquatic insects are what we refer to as benthic invertebrates, uh, meaning they don't have backbones. And these organisms are important to the ecology because um, they're, they're sort of the base of the food chain. They're what um, the small fish feed on and some of the larger fish. And they, um, they're sort of secondary consumers, so they, the plant matter and, and organic matter is broken down by some of these organisms at the bottom of the, of the stream. And they can be an indicator of water quality. So some of these species, um, if they're present, um, can be an indication of of um, sort of a, a high level level of oxygen, and, and some of them are very pollution intolerant. So you can sort of, um, if you get a good sample of these organisms in, in the water, in the water body that you're studying, you can get an idea of the water quality based on the population. So these are um, these are important organisms that we don't even think about on a, on a daily basis. And, um, some of these things are are um, sort of terrifying if, if you're um, around two inches tall. <laughs> this is uh, another example of you. This is dragonfly larvae. This is the larva of a dragonfly. Water is soaked inside the abdomen by an opening in the last segment. Muscular contractions move the water in and out. Specialized tracheal growths absorb the oxygen from the water. The insect can expel a jet of water to move much faster than if it was swimming only with its legs. I can't really tell what you're saying either. <laughs> the physical trait that sets apart Odonata from other insects is their overdeveloped underlip called labium. are mowing down on the larvae and when they become adults, when they emerge from the water, um, they're um, feeding on mosquitoes as well as, as adults when they're flying around the marshes and wetlands. This guy is a giant water bug and this is, that's my hand. This, this was captured when I was in school near Peterborough. Um, these things are huge. Um, another common name for them is, is uh, toe biters. <laughs> Uh, they, they can deliver a sting, and it's supposed to be uh, one of the most painful stings. Um, so the, the long proboscis you see um, sticking in the fish there, um, they inject a, a, a stinging or a paralyzing toxin into the fish. And um, This was our class pet when I, was in, uh, when I was in school, part of the limnology class. So we were studying all the insects and invertebrates in the water, and uh, someone had caught this as part of uh, one of our, our outings in, in the class, and we would feed it minnows. Um, when we got bored in class. <laughs> so, <clears throat> uh, the Six Nations, or Haudenosaunee in the Grand River, um, the history goes back further than 1784 um, to um, sort of, we all know about the, the neutrals or the Adirondaran, Adir, Adirondaran people that are referred to who uh, lived here um, throughout the Grand River in southern Ontario. And um, after the war with our people, the Haudenosaunee, um, they were sort of um, conquered and, and absorbed afterwards. But um, 
1784, after that, when, when the Six Nations people arrived here and started building our, our settlements along the river, um, based on the, some of the archaeology work that's been done, they lived a, a very close lifestyle to the, the one that had, they had lived in New York State. So um, they lived in villages, um, and they would plant their corn across the river. Um, and uh, they maintained hunting grounds, so they were still doing whole agriculture. Like they had access to horses, and, and they all, most of them lived in cabins, like modern, modern cabins that they built. Um, they weren't living in longhouses, but <clears throat> and they were using um, steel, iron tools, and they were using guns. But they were still doing whole agriculture um, with the the um, companion planting with the mounds. And they were hunting deer. Most of the diet they were they were eating was um, fish from the river and, and wild animals. Except um, the Mohawk village in Brantford, um, they were more closely uh, uh, reflecting the, the European uh, diet of the time and lifestyle of the time. So all the small Cayuga, Onondaga, and, and other villages that were along the river were still maintaining a life, lifestyle that reflected the, the old lifestyle they had been living back in New York State. Um, so that that's sort of, uh, to give you an idea, um, by the 1930s, you know, not that long afterwards, um, there was massive flooding occurring in, in the Lower Grand River due to, um, uh, as the land was, was leased off and, and began to be cleared for agriculture by, um, by the Euro-Canadian farmers, um, that all that deforestation and the draining of the wetlands and swamps led to massive flooding by the 18, 1830s, and this is also shown in some of the archaeology work that's been done along the river. Um, and so in the 1930s, um, parts of the river had dried up during cer certain parts of the year, and um, it was, um, pollution was rampant already by that time. So you can see how fast the, the land changed, the land use changed from, um, you know, the original Haudenosaunee villages um, where, where they would build their village and it would be uh, enveloped by the forest. They didn't clear cut the forest, they kept it close to their village. And they kept the forest close to their corn fields as well, their, their agricultural fields. So they, they didn't practice clear cutting like, like the, the Euro-Canadian farmers. Uh, once, they, once that style of farming was, was introduced, um, that's what led to the massive deforestation and flooding. And so this is an example of some of the habitat that was maintained um, by the Ongohoi people who lived along the river. This is an oak savanna. And so these, these savannas are, were maintained for um, the use of hunting because they, they would attract wildlife. They're sort of like a parkland. And this is common throughout southern Ontario and in and parts of um, eastern North America where these savannas were maintained um, for hunting and bringing in wildlife. And not only that, these areas, and when we look at the culture, were important because they, they, um, when we do kanohonyo, o handagariwadehko, uh, and we talk about uh, which is the grasses and the, the weeds and the flowers. That was, it was important enough to them to include that in their Thanksgiving address because this, this is where they gathered their medicine. This is where um, the migratory birds, is a very important area for migratory birds to come and breed and, and forage for insects. And so um, these places were very important. When, we, when, when you look at what they talk about in our ceremonies. When you hear the birds singing in the spring, you know, it gives you that good feeling. You know, they say that that's like a medicine. It makes you feel well inside. And the same thing when you see the flowers blooming in the spring and throughout the summer. It's, it's, just, it's just like a medicine. It makes you feel well when you, see, when you see that. And so these places were important, not just for hunting and, and for food, but um, for their spiritual health and, and for uh, their medicinal use as well. So these, these types of places were maintained throughout Eastern North America for um, thousands of years. And they were still practicing it when they came to Grand River um, after 1784. And so what's our, what's our relationship now with the Grand River? From those people who came um, after 1784 to now, um, like what we have left is um, Chiefswood Park. Um, the rest of the, the area along the river is, is private property. And uh, Chiefswood Park is sort of has remnant um, sort of older growth trees that you can still go and see. 
what the the riparian habitat that the habitat that occurs on the river riverside is maintained as is mowed grass. Um, it's just sort of uh, uh, a black hole of of um, you know it's gas to mow it. Um, the, it's not a very productive habitat. There's very low biodiversity. And on the bank, all those um, brown plants on the bank there are most of them are invasive species that are introduced because they had regraded the the stream the shoreline. Um, when we when you regrade the shoreline, when you do any sort of <clears throat> disturbance to the shoreline, you allow for the water to erode, and this is what sort of leads to the color of the river because of the the soil type we have is um, clay silt soils along uh, along the lower Grand, and so when those wash into the river, um, they take a long time to settle out. Um, oftentimes, as long as the water is moving, some of these particles are are so small that they'll they won't ever settle. This is uh, from last spring. This is a, um, a rain event that occurred. And you see um, a cubic um, a meter cubed per second of water. Um, there was a heavy rainfall, and you see that it's over 600. Like it's sort of off the charts. Um, that's how much water is going into the, into the Grand River now because um, it's still not vegetated. The, the deforestation is still, um, it hasn't recovered yet. And when we have hard surfaces like um, parking lots and roads and um, development, um, it sort of um, funnels the water faster into the river and, it, and you get these um, sort of spikes in, in, in water level. And that sort of um, aggravates things like erosion, bank erosion, soil erosion, things like that. Um, this is the turbidity, of the, the turbidity of the water, like the, how clear it is. So you see the big spike after the rainfall that same rainfall, it, it goes you know, almost off the charts again. So these are massive fluctuations we see in the Grand River because of the development and the, the high population. These urban, it's, it's almost an urban water waterway now. Um, so some of the urban waterways you see in cities, they fill up really fast when there's a rain event and they, they, um, they empty out really fast. So that can be hard on some of the wildlife, like the fish, and it can affect spawning habitat and things like that. So another image of the Carolinian forest, and, and this is what, um, in, in, uh, as far as habitat, referred to a vernal pool. So these, um, these we call them swamps in Six Nations. Like uh, when you're in the bush and you find like a, a big uh, swamp back there, um, ecologists refer to them as vernal pools and they're important habitats because they, they provide uh, cover for things like um, migratory ducks and waterfall. And what the waterfall are, are after are these fairy shrimp. Um, and so I remember as a kid seeing these in, in the swamps behind my parents' house in the bush, and I would, I would look, just stare at them for hours because I'm, I'm like that. But, <laughs> but I always wondered what they were, and it wasn't until I went to um, college and I started learning about the, the benthic invertebrates and, and, and the role of these ecosystems in, in southern Ontario and, um, you know, these... These organisms they can they can lay dormant in dry in the dry um, swamps and, and uh, ponds for months or years at a time until the rain comes back and then they um, when the when the eggs um, are remoistened by the rainfall they they emerge and this this is part of the um, crustacean family so the same family as uh, shrimp so. Again, um, I went to a, a presentation by the Grand River Conservation Authority. Uh, this was last May, and they have tons of data about the Grand River, um, the water quality, the, um, the flood capacity, things like that, um, the forests and, and wetlands. And when you, when, they have, um, when you look at their maps and it shows Six Nations, it's just a big blank because they don't have any data for Six Nations. Um, so, again, when I ask, like, what's your attitude towards the river, you know, I hear... A lot of negativity about it. You know, we we sort of um, I hear people even talk down about the about the river. Um, when we have that kind of attitude, I feel like it, it makes it okay for people to not um, to sort of uh, it sort of excuses our, our our practices or our lifestyles when we 
say, you know, it's just a dirty river, and I don't, I don't eat the fish out of there, and I would never swim in there. Um, but like I said, it was polluted in, in the 1930s, and a lot of work has been done since then to sort of bring it back to a, a state of, of health. And so it's come a long way, and it's one of the, the fish in the water are edible now, and, and they're, um, compared to other southern Ontario streams um, and lakes, it, they're fairly clean, actually, and, and they are edible. So that's the question I get all the time. Can we eat the fish out of the river? And the answer is yes, I do, anyway. <laughs> um, so, like I said, in, by the 1930s, or uh, 1830s, the tree cover had been reduced to 5 or 6% of what had, it had previously been. And so one of the goals set by the Grand River Conservation Authority is to bring it back to at least 30%, and so far they have it to around 20%. Um, and so again, when I say that there's a lot of blank data about uh, Six Nations, we see that big green patch there, and we don't know if they've included our forests into their data or not. Um, but it would be it would be interesting to find out um, and to be able to share that the knowledge and and the um, the information. So again, our attitudes about the river. We're, we're a visual species. We base a lot of, of our, 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 our opinions on, our, on what we see. Um, so we see that the water isn't clear, but doesn't, doesn't necessarily mean it's clean. If you look at a pool of, um, of heavy water, from a, uh, which is waste from a, a nuclear tr treatment facility, it's perfectly clear and blue, and it looks beautiful, but you can't drink it. It would kill you. <laughs> you can't even touch it. So just because it's clear water doesn't mean it's clean. Um, actually, um, a lot of the, the lakes, the Great Lakes in our area, were um, a little turbid naturally because that allowed for fish like walleye to hunt closer in to the shore during um, um, more daylight hours. And things like smelt, when people used to get smelt out of Lake Erie, it wasn't that long ago, um, but the introduction of the zebra mussels caused um, the, the lakes to be, become really clear because they filter so much water. So the Lake Ontario itself is, um, the entirety of the water is filtered every three days by zebra mussels. That's how um, prevalent the invasive zebra mussels are in, in, in the lakes. And so with that clear water, things like smelt, they spawn further down and deeper in the water now because um, they sort of prefer to spur spawn and um, more turbid waters, waters that aren't as clear. So these are some things that, that we don't realize that happen. I've had that question before, why, how come we don't, uh, people don't catch smelt anymore at Lake Erie? And that was the reason I went, when I researched it, was that the water is so clear now from the zebra mussels that the, the um, smelt are spawning deeper in the water and aren't, aren't coming up to the beaches anymore. And so, uh, like, we see this in Six Nations. <laughs> um, and it's, it's, it's not healthy to, to have this in our community when these things happen, like we, when these things are burned here. Cars, we have lid, um, pure lid melting from the, the counterweights and the tires, um, the electronics, the, the seat material. All, when you burn those, it releases things like dioxin, dioxin furans, which, which also are in the paint of the car. And, um, you know, those are the most, some of the most toxic substances known to man. Um, they, cause, they can cause cancer or be carcinogenic in very, very low quantities. But this is a, a common occurrence here. So when we have the attitude of the river is just a dirty, um, you know, thing that's not worth, um, you know, sort of saving or it's, uh, it's just a, sort of like a, a ditch that, you know, uh, we don't have any respect for it, then, then our, this sort of activity, we don't feel as bad about it. Or we feel like it's, um, you know, it's something that we don't have to worry about. Or, um, but, um, like at Guyana State, we do ecological restoration, and uh, the people who work there, most of us are from Six Nations, and we're all working towards restoring not just the Grand River, but um, Southern Ontario and the Carolinian Forest and the, the prairies and, and oak savannas, uh, bringing back those, those wild spaces and contributing back to restoring the land to something that, um, that's more natural. And so we work towards educating people about that. And this is a, a, 
this is Kilbride, Kilbride Provincially Significant Wetland, where we're, we're restoring some of the, um, the wetland species back into an area that was disturbed by a pipeline project. And so that's some of the work that we do. We work um, on large-scale projects. So when they disturb land, they're required to um, restore some of some land that's that uh, to replace the land that's been sort of destroyed. And so that's where we come in and we we replant uh, a lot of these these large projects. And I'm just going to show you some pictures um, that I've taken along the river. Um, this is these were mostly were taken last spring. And these are migratory uh, waterfall that come up the rivers. And the Grand River is a really important place for um, migratory birds that, that come up from uh, the, the states and, and uh, Central America. So this is a common merganser. This is, these are ring-necked ducks. This is taken down by um, Dunville, Bing Island. This is a bufflehead. There's another common merganser. This is a hooded merganser. So I've seen these in the swamps here in, in Six Nations, and most of these birds, they, they land in the swamps behind their houses, and people, you know, not a lot of people go in the bush to see these things, but I've, I've been back there and I've seen a lot of these. These are some, these are uh, um, a little more recent. These are, um, um, these are cranes. What's the word? What am, uh, uh, I can't think of it. <laughs> um, yeah, they're um, sandhill cranes, that's what they are. This is taken in Cayuga. Um, the sandhill cranes aren't known to nest in the Grand River um, Valley, but um, I, I took a picture of these, and two years ago I, I seen a, a family of these um, in Cayuga along the roadside standing in a marsh. So. They are nesting in the Grand River. They're, they were at one time almost extirpated from southern Ontario, but they've been making a comeback in the past um, decade or two. So we're seeing more and more of these coming back as um, you know work is being done to restore the the forest in the Grand River. Um, this is a oh, another migratory bird. This is a, a Blackburnian um, warbler. And so these, these little guys travel all the way down to Central South America every year, and they tr travel all the way back every spring. And that's just one of the many, many species that, that travel back and forth. And like I said, in our, in our ceremonies, we talk about how the, the singing of the birds, they make you feel well. This, this is just, these are just examples of, of that massive migration that happens every year in the Grand River. I took this picture um, just south of Cayuga, almost to Dunville. <clears throat> this is a, a juvenile bald eagle. It's a second, second year plumage. And he was sitting right by the road, right at, right at eye level. <laughs> um, again, the importance of the, of the wetlands and swamps. Um, you know, we, we shouldn't drain the wetlands. Six Nations has some really um, significant large wetlands that are important areas for like I showed you, the migratory birds, but they're also important for filtering groundwater. They're important for um, things like amphibians, like um, frogs. So frogs are another indicator because they, um, they pick up a lot of toxins through their skin. So if there's a, a, a contaminant in the water and you don't hear the frogs anymore, it's because you know, something's affecting the water. And so um, that's another indicator that we can, we can use. So if there's a spring where you don't hear any frogs, we know that there's something really wrong with the water. Um, and another sort of uh, important thing, role that the wetlands and swamps play is that uh, they absorb water when it rains and they release it back into the rivers and streams slowly over time, so it, it reduces the chance of flooding. And these are also important places for spawning. So in the spring every year, the men from Six Nations go out and we spear walleye, we spear pike, and uh, at one time, all of these wetlands were um, uh, fed the streams that um, the fish spawned in. But um, I seen a figure at, at one point, I can't remember where, uh, I've been trying to track it down again, but I think 97% um, of the wetlands in southern Ontario have been drained for agriculture. And so the other, role, the, thing, the, the other role that these wetlands play is that they slow the water down and they allow for contaminants and um, nutrients to um, absorb into the plants and it sort of polishes and cleans the water off. 
Uh, so I think that's uh, yeah, that's the last one. So I think there are some. Uh, there's any questions? And I would just throw a bunch of information at you. It was in the. <laughs> How close can you build to wetlands? Yeah. Um, we got a spot in the falls that's 484 acres. About 220 acres of it is wetlands that they want to put a development in there. They want to develop about 40% of the property. So they're saying there's like a 30 meter setback or even backyards that the, the wetlands will be okay, but we're concerned that like road stalls and you know, like spring for uh, uh, daily lines and like all that kind of stuff. Build on top of the yeah. Yeah, any kind of development um, would degrade the, the habitat um, to a certain degree. And it depends on like what kind of species are, are there as far as like maybe like nesting birds and things like that. So one of the species they found in Six Nations in, in our wetlands and our swamps was the prothonotary warbler, uh, which um, migrates from South America every year. And it's um, considered endangered right now in Southern Ontario. So if there are species like that, Occurring there, then they might have to, um, you know, it might be a good idea to make this make the setbacks a little, a little more because they require um, deep forest to to be um, to as nesting habitat. Any other questions? The invasive species. Um, well, it depends on what <laughs> which invasive species they're invasive fish, there's invasive mussels, there's invasive plants, there's invasive trees, there's invasive birds. <laughs> um, it's, it's getting worse. Invasive species are one of the leading causes of extinctions on, on the earth. So um, one example is like uh, feral cats. So uh, there's an estimate that um, cats in North America, feral cats and um, pet cats kill you know, around like uh, 8 billion birds migratory birds across North America every year. And that's not even including, you know, traffic and um, buildings and things like that. Um, yeah? How, how important are the butterfly gardens? Like, did you guys ever start one? I was, I was part of, I asked you to be a part of a project, but I never heard back whether or not it started or when. Um, we have built butterfly gardens for, with um, some projects like we built one at O.M. Smith uh, in the summer. Um, it depends a lot on things like funding, to get funding to get projects going like that. So or, how important are um, I guess, yeah, they're, they're important for butterflies. Not just butterflies, but um, like hummingbirds and, and honeybees and, and other types of bees that pollinate. Yeah, they're, they're important because um, when we like we have a, a growing um, agricultural industry of tobacco in Six Nations because they had the, the clay tolerant strain of tobacco now. So all the old fields that were important for pollinators are being converted to ag agriculture now. <clears throat> so like if there was an old field that no one was farming, it's being put back to work for tobacco in a lot of cases now and those areas were important for um, butterflies and other pollinators. I don't know if that answers your question. <laughs> any other, any other questions? About restoration, how effective is restoration? It's, it's going to be a certain percentage as good as it used to be, right? Or can you get it back to where it was? Um, I don't think it, it could be taken back exactly to where it was. It would require, I think, humans to be removed <laughs> totally. <laughs> Um, but it, it can be effective. It, it can increase the um, the native plants because uh, some areas are totally totally inundated with invasive species, and with restoration, we can we can restore it up to seventy percent of um, native species that um, that occur naturally in, in the area, especially if it's a heavily disturbed um, construction site or or large um, highway project, something like like that. Um, anytime you disturb, disturb the soil, the invasive species will move in and outcompete the native species.
last last week you showed us a seedling of a um, chestnut. Yeah. And my brother keeps buying seedlings from wherever you get them, and he keeps planting them, but they keep dying, and um, I want to know why they're dying. Why they don't live when you plant them? Is there, is there something wrong with the soil or the area or what? Um, of chestnut? I'm not sure it's a good question. It, it could be something something to do with the soil. Um, the like trees have a really close relationship to the soil. Um, so if you allow the tree to be inundated with grass and other plants, um, it can affect the the it can compete with the with the sapling. And so keeping it um, trimmed or mowed around the tree for a time until it's able to establish. Um, another thing that a lot of people um, have to look, you have to look at the, the moisture regime, regime that is required for the tree. So if it's in an area that's too moist or too dry, that, that can affect it as well. Um, the other thing um, to look at is um, the, where you're planting it, how disturbed has it been. So it could have been um, at one time scraped of topsoil. And so it makes it harder for that um, tree to survive in that. It might require um, more of a topsoil or uh, organic layer of leaves or, or wood chips to help it help it grow because the, the organic layer um, breaks down and the fun, fungus and bacteria are what make the soil healthy again. And so um, trees respond to that um, when you plant them. Um, I was wondering if, what are, what are the sort of things that we can do, like everyone can sort of do easy things that people can do or begin doing just in their sort of daily routines around here that would help bring the environment back to a healthy state? Um, <clears throat> one thing that I, I see a lot and it, and it bothers me because I, I don't know if it bothers anyone else, <laughs> is like the mowed grass, like massive yards. Like it, it's just a black hole. I mean, you can do whatever you want on your property, and, but uh, <laughs> it's just a black hole. It's, it's just money that goes into it. You, you cut it, and you cut it, and you cut it, and it's burning gas. It's you know, polluting the air, and it's not creating habitat for anything. So if you can, if you can convert even a percentage of that to um, be more wild with flowers and things that will attract hummingbirds and butterflies and um, animals that help pollinate, um, you know, uh, they not only pollinate the wild plants, but they pollinate our food crops as well. And so, any any space that you can you can sort of set aside for wildlife or for habitat um, is is a gain, rather than just mowing it forever. <laughs> and even our gardening gardening practices. Every time we we, if you can look into more um, sustainable agriculture like permaculture, because every time we we rototill or turn over the soil. It, it opens it up, and um, the bacteria are sort of cooked by the sunlight, and it sort of destroys that relationship that's, that's happening in the soil that, that's important. So at one time, um, we didn't have earthworms in North America, and um, some of the historical, historical accounts I read was that the topsoil, the organic layer, not just the, the clay, but the topsoil was up to 16 feet deep in some places. And when, you, when they deforested the, the land, it, it sort of all... Um, washed into the, the waterways and, and lakes and oceans. And I read another figure that said that up to um, two-thirds of the topsoil has, on Earth has been washed off the land due to deforestation and, and habitat destruction by humans. So that, that um, just, um, you know, doing permaculture and not tilling the land and allowing the bacteria and the fungus to exist in the soil because... Um, Another, I didn't post these figures, I should have put them in here. <laughs> um, but um, as far as capturing carbon <clears throat> from the atmosphere, <clears throat> up to two-thirds of the, of the carbon is, is held in, in living soil, um, two-thirds more than the plants on top of the soil. So the plants on top of the soil are, are storing carbon, but it's the bacteria and, and the organisms in, in the ground that are actually holding most of the carbon. So every time you open it and, and turn it over, you're releasing carbon and more carbon into the atmosphere and allowing it to um, sort of really um, mobilizing it. If that answers your question. <laughs> yeah, so I can trade my lawnmower in, I guess. Is that what you're saying? <laughs> 
Well, you can just reduce the size of, of your, um, your cut area and convert some of it to a uh, more natural state. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And if you come to Guyana State, we can, we can fill you in on all that information <laughs> on how to do it and uh, what species you can use and which ones you don't want, things like that. Uh, speaking of Guyana, say I was wondering if you could sp speak a little bit more about what you folks do over there and what services and things are available for people just to drop by and. Yeah, um, we get people every day coming coming in. Um, some of them just want to know about trees. They want to know about planting trees or um, you know where they should, where we can plant a certain type of tree or. Uh, so the services we we provide are. Uh, like I said, ecological restoration, we can come and do assessments on your property and advise you on how to make it a more natural or, or um, healthy um, ecology, uh, something that's more reflective of a, of a native ecology. And um, we can come and actually plant the trees for you or we can advise you on what, what species you can, you can use and how you can do it because there are ways that you can do it without spending a whole lot of money, um, especially when it comes to like um, wet areas where it's... Um, sort of a swamp. People always want to put a tree, a, a, a willow tree there, like a weeping willow, and those are invasive. They're uh, introduced from Europe. Um, so we don't sell those. <laughs> we'll tell you to plant something else. <laughs> or to turn it into a wetland. Wet, let, the, let, wetland let the wetland plants um, grow there. Uh, and the other services we have are um, tree removal. We'll come in, we'll do an assessment, and we can remove trees. Um, and right now we're doing ecotourism, so we are taking in, we can uh, schedule tours for groups to come and see the, the longhouse that we built and we can uh, give you a tour of the, the greenhouse and give you more information that way. Um, and if you have property and there's um, native species and, and forest growing on it, if you want to, you know, if you want to let us come there and collect seed, uh, we can do that. and, and um, you know, we keep track of everyone, all the landowners who allow us to come and collect seed. And, um, you know, we can give you more information that way. When we're on your property, you can come with us and, and we'll, we can advise you and we can teach you, you know, whatever we can while we're on site. Um, and that's what, that's sort of what we provide to the, to the community. Is there a cost for that or is that free of charge? For us to come and collect the seed? Yeah. It's, it's free. We just come in. <laughs> We come and uh, take it because we're, we're using it, we're growing it. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, so like uh, hickory, oak, um, maple, sugar maple, you know, all those tree species and some of the, the grass species we're after too, the, the warm season grasses. Um, they're not super common around here anymore, but um, at one time they were. Any other questions? I've got a fancy microphone here. You guys, uh collaborate with like Ducks Unlimited or anything like that to do some habitat restoration? Um, like if, some of those big organizations? Yeah, if they approached us, we would. Like uh, the Royal Botanic, Botanical Gardens, we've worked with them to do invasive species removal. And yeah, um, yeah any, any, we'll work with anyone. We work with universities and um, other organizations and, and Six Nations and, and yeah, authorities. One of my friends, he's, his friend had uh, Ducks Unlimited come in out down the river a little ways and they did a whole bunch of development, put in ponds and did landscaping, yeah. huge to put in big ponds for ducks, yeah. planted. So I know that's another option for you guys to try and hook up with them and. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. All right. Oh. What's the relationship between uh, the, like flyways, the old migration routes of the birds yeah. and some of the upheaval that's happened along the Grand? Like, so, has there been, uh, are the birds still flocking the, you know, the way they did 100 years ago? Uh, um, they're, they're still migrating, yeah. Um, <clears throat> most, a lot of the populations are on, on a decline. So something like the red-winged blackbird is a really common species, but, um, and then they're not endangered, but they say that their populations, populations have declined by 18% since um, the year 2000. So, you know, it's something that you see tons of, but um, every year they're declining more and more. Another one is, um, is the, the wood thrush. So uh, the wood thrush is, 
is uh, on a steep decline as well, and it's it's sort of um, being picked up on by the ministry, and they're they're asking some of the projects to provide data on things like the wood thrush because their populations are declining as well, whereas they were a, a really common species just 10 years ago. They were um, still in abundance, but as far as the flyaways, um, as far as I know, they're still active, but overall, a lot of the species are in decline, except the Canada goose, <laughs> which is, it seems like there's more of those than ever. Um, and something, and things like the, the mallard, mallard duck. Yeah. Um, is it safe to say that every species has a purpose and a function in the big scheme of things? Like uh, in our ecosystem, or are there some things that just they're just there just to irritate us? Other than um, humans, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, the biggest one. But I'm thinking like mosquitoes, black flies, wood ticks, that kind of thing. Like, what is their purposeful function in creation? Um, yeah, so I, I've had that question about wood ticks. You know, what's, what's the function of a wood tick? Uh, I, I spend a lot of time thinking about it. <laughs> Probably more time than I should have, but. <laughs> uh, so a wood tick, um, ticks in general are vectors of disease. Um, and so the reservoir, or like the, the thing, the animals that carry the disease, um, the wood ticks suck on their blood and, and then they, they um, spread the disease like that. And that's sort of a way of controlling some populations. Um, also, like if there's a, a weak individual in a population, say it's a moose, and he has a weak, um, immune system or it's just a weak individual and the ticks are sort of slowing it down um, and it gets uh, removed by wolves. So that's, it's now removed from the, from the gene pool and it allows the stronger animals to, um, to um, continue and, and to um, pass on their strong genetics. So they play a role that way in, in, in improving the genetic fitness of, of a lot of deer and populations and uh, birds, everything, humans, <laughs> unfortunately. But uh, it's the same thing with, with mosquitoes. Mosquitoes are another vector of disease. Um, you know, millions of people every year are infected with malaria and things like that. But um, you know, that's that's the role they play in, in the ecology. Is that they um, they also provide um, food for a lot of um, like birds and, and insects as well. Yeah. So they, they do play a role. They're, they're not you know the the thing that plays the least like the animal that doesn't play any role really is humans. Everything. <laughs> We do basically destroys the environment. Um, everything from turning on our, our lights in the morning and start starting our car and drinking our coffee, we've already, you know, contributed to uh, our carbon footprint just in, in our morning <laughs> morning ritual. <laughs> yeah, I was just wondering how important is uh, things like technology that we have now, like drones and GIS and all this fancy. Uh, planning things out there now. Are you guys using that kind of technology to help? Look, everyone's got a phone. They can take pictures of anything they got. And they know a geographical Latin long right where they are. Like, are they u using that kind of stuff to? Uh, no, not, not yet. I wish we had it. <laughs> it would be nice to have um, uh, all that kind of technology. A lot of what we do, because we're not for profit, is, is based on funding. And so we're limited that way. And as far as you know, what we can get is is equipment or software or technology like that. And the other thing is training, because that also requires a lot of you know, funding to train people as well and to be able to afford to hire the staff that can do all, this, all of those things. It would be nice if we could we would be able to do a lot more. Are there any trees around here that are good to build a log house? Uh, yeah, I guess you could. Like, um, the old cookhouse and longhouse, like an Onondaga longhouse, and all those old buildings like that, like that, those old timber buildings, I think a lot of those were built out of um, chestnut. And those trees aren't around anymore, but um, they used to use it because it was just as strong as oak, but it was easier to split and it was easier to carve. Um, so you, you can use any sort of uh, hardwood tree to build uh, a cabin out of it just takes a lot of work, and uh, you need a, a good mill to um, to shape the logs. And uh, originally, that's what a lot of the the um, hardwoods were uh, harvested for was for the, the lumber to build um, ships and to build um, 
homeless and things like that. How many, how many different species are there words for in our languages? Uh, good question. <laughs> um, not as many as, as there could be. Uh, Do there I, used to be? Yeah, there's many as there used to be. Um, I get, when I talk to people about the, the names for plants and things like that, they, you know, everyone, all the speakers, it was just like how we are now. Like I know a lot about ecology, but not everyone knows about ecology. It was the same thing um, when people were still speaking the language. You know, some of them knew a lot about uh, one thing, and some of them knew a lot about uh, you know trees and plants and medicines, and they could name every single one. Um, so, but if it wasn't important to you, then you didn't know all the names for everything, right? But um, so it, there isn't a whole lot anymore. Like the main ones we still have, like the main tree species, but um, a lot of the plants, herbaceous plants, we don't, that I, that I know of, we don't have a lot of the names anymore that, I, uh, that I've heard. But I, I don't know the number offhand. <laughs> what would you say, um, we, uh, what is the most at risk around here? Like what is your biggest concern in terms of uh, environmental loss here in our community? Biggest concern? Um, I think right now the biggest concern for me would be um, the forest because I, I see it every year being reduced. And so, like I said, we're, we're the largest tract of Carolinian forest in Canada, but I don't think we're gonna have that, that title much longer just based on the population growth and the need for housing and um, development, things like that. Um, and some of the, <clears throat> I've been along the river um, in what people refer to as the swamps, the swamps. <laughs> uh, they're, just, they're just past the flats. <laughs> and um, they're, they're uh, to me, uh, the, the size of the trees in there and, and the, the diversity, diversity that I see occurring there in, in birds and amphibians and things like that, um, there aren't a whole lot of places left like that in the Grand River. Uh, and you know it's all private property they could technically go in and cut it all down tomorrow and no one would be able to do anything about it so to me those those um, hardwood swamps that occur in the bush and, and those large wetlands and, and um, those um, forests along the river are, are significant to me um, they have the greatest diversity that I've seen oh yep Oh, thank you. I'm like a movie star. Uh, have you noticed any of the animals in the area, uh, their behaviors changing with um, changes in climate? Some of the, the extremes that maybe we see in the spring where, where mm -hmm. it, it seems to be warming up and then suddenly gets really cold again? Um, not so much the animals. But I've noticed like the trees seem to be under a lot of stress. Um, <clears throat> like I don't know if anyone else looks at these things, but <laughs> uh, yeah, I sometimes do. That's why I'm asking. <laughs> um, so last year, only only thirty percent of the trees went to seed, and and you know no one really knows why. I think it's because of the the warm winters we've had. Uh, from what I understand, the warm winters put the trees under a lot of stress because they require that dormancy that um, from the cold as part of their life cycle and, and um, as sort of a, a time for them to rest basically and, and to re when the spring when they when they um, go to see or when they um, sprout their, their leaves and um, when the, the snow melts right it, it all has like a, an effect on on the way the trees are, are um, interacting with each other and, and with the ecology so that's the one thing that I sort of noticed and I have people every year asking me if it, if they should or shouldn't tap their trees. <laughs> because um, I know for sure last year, most of the maple trees, hard maple trees, or sugar maple trees dropped their keys in August. So they aborted their seed um, about two months before they would normally fall. And so that to me indicates that the tree is under a lot of stress. 
And the other thing I see a lot of on things like oak, like uh, acorns, is that they're heavily, heavily infested with, um, with the, the little grubs that, that attack them. Um, so that could be an indication that they're, maybe their immune systems aren't, aren't fighting back as strong as they, they normally would. I can't say for sure, but that's just from what I've observed. Are the, the grubs on the oak trees you're talking about, is that what creates the, all the little holes in the leaves? Yeah. Thank you. Speaking of trees, which is, which is, uh, where is the biggest, oldest tree on this reserve that you know of? <laughs> Since you know. seem to know about like, a lot of weird things. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I shouldn't call that weird, but uh, you know what I mean. I've seen a lot of your properties and you probably don't even know that I've been. <laughs> <laughs> We didn't throw most of the woods in Six Nations. And so, so, so I saw my car in that one picture. Whereabouts is that? <laughs> I left something in the back seat. Come see me after the... After the right. no. <laughs> um, I don't know. I've seen some, some big ones. Chisu Park has some really big... A couple of really big oaks. Um, I know, like, just in my parents' property, they've cut down a couple of the oaks, and they were, you know, um, I don't know, maybe um, three feet across... Uh, like diameter wise and uh, when I did the ring count I counted I think I counted around um, 270 rings on some of them and there's bigger ones than that um, that occur here so those you know I would imagine those are around 300 just over 300 years old so they're like middle aged trees <laughs> trees experience time different than we do <laughs> I have another question from the audience uh, who's too shy to ask themselves, but what is the um, effect of shipping container homes on the environment? Shipping container homes? Yeah. I am not familiar with those, <laughs> with that. Okay. I'm not sure. Anybody else? How do you feel about uh, genetically modifying the American chestnut? Hmm. I think that at this point, it hasn't recovered on its own. And so in order for us to have that, because um, that, that is a part of our, our culture, like it is in our stories, the American chestnut, um, I think some of the older stories that they have, it seem, they seem to be before we had agriculture, so that's what it seems like it was one of their staple foods was the American chestnut. So if, if we bring it back, because the strain they have now is 99% American chestnut and that 1% of the Japanese strain is, is for disease resistance, right? So it, um, the way I feel about it is if I had one, I would probably plant it and grow it because, um, you know, the, the pure strain isn't, isn't doing quite as well. There, I think there is one pure strain that, that is doing okay, but you, you, shrink the, you shrink the genetics. So if there is another disease that comes in and you've only planted the original strain and it gets wiped out again, then you don't have anything. So if you have that more, maybe a, a more robust uh, resistance to disease, if you include the Japanese um, genetics in it, it might be a good idea to either have both or you know, to not exclu exclude it from, from planting. So uh, another kind of question, I guess. So if, if uh, you had your way, let's say, what do you think this community should look like in 50 years? Like if we were to travel in time and come back, what will we see driving down fourth line? <laughs> um, <clears throat> I would like to see um, some agricultural fields, not all of them, um, converted to um, prairie or grassland because there's some massive uh, fields that we have here. And if you were to you know, convert 1% back to uh, a restored ecology and um, you know maybe some of it back towards forest a forested ecology it would be a lot and um, I would also want to um, maintain the um, the hedgerows that that connect the forests to each other because those are equally as important for wildlife as, as the forests are because they those corridors are how animals and wildlife are moving between areas and um, so in 50 years, if we could um, convert some of our 
our farmland just to not all of it just a small percentage of it you know a few fields to grassland and maintaining that grassland um, the integrity the ecological integrity of those um, of those and the existing forest as much as we can um, I think it would be a gain uh, for us as far as um, capturing um, carbon from the atmosphere and and even allowing for the rainfall to not hit the exposed soil to have it hit vegetation and to um, retain as much of the wetlands as we, as we have now and even maybe converting um, or restoring some of the wetlands that that used to be there that, are, that were drained for um, agriculture. So it wouldn't take much. It would just take, you know, a few generous people to <laughs> convert their agricultural fields to, to prairie or wetland or forest. And So would that also mean that we'd have to stop some of the corporate type farming that's taking place here now? Like, we had to put an end to that. <laughs> don't want to put you on the spot. But. I don't know. I got to leave here alone later. I don't want to get. <laughs> I don't want any angry farmers after me. <laughs> no, uh, I think a lot of farmers understand that, you know, the importance of the ecology, um, and so I think having them on board and, and working, working closely with them, um, even if it's a strip along one corner of the, their field, to convert it. You know, it's it's better than it's a, it's a gain. Again, it's a gain for ecology and carbon capture, um, and maybe uh, looking into ways to um, uh, sort of uh, shift the agricultural practices to something more sustainable, if it's possible, um, and you know, something that's not going to hurt the farmer. Um, yeah, I think working together with the farmers is, is a better answer than working against them, you know, that's, that's my point of view anyway, because they are important for, you know, providing growing the food, they grow the white corn and the flint corn for the community and that's that's been uh, important for the longhouse and the ceremonies, things like that. So, um, you know, working with them is, is, I think, is a better option. Everyone working together, um, to me, is always the best option rather than mm -hmm. working against each other. <laughs> yeah, I, I agree. Um, do you see, uh, is tobacco like a, a tough crop to grow? in this soil and in our uh, community, I guess? Well, as far as I know, the, the commercial tobacco is. Like, that's why they grew it down like towards Del Delhi and the sandy areas. But that's from what I understand. Like, I don't know too much about it, but the, um, you know, the, the new strain that like, it tolerates clay and it grows well in clay, you know, that's, um, it's easier to grow um, here. And, but Indian tobacco um, seems to do well here. So um, we've always grown it, right? And, and um, so I guess like the commercial tobacco might be hard to grow here, but the, the new strains are, are easier to grow from what I understand. I have a question. Um, my mom's sitting here with me and she wants to know um, how or what um, we can do to get the slippery elm kind of um, back up to productivity, I guess, because it's been kind of attacked by the beetles and whatnot? Yeah, so <clears throat> the Dutch elm disease was introduced in the 1800s and it wiped out the large elms that we had used to cover our longhouses with. Um, it still occurs here, I find, I find um, slippery elm uh, to be more tolerant of, of the disease than American or white elm. Um, they maybe get to a certain size, maybe 25 years, and then, then they, they succumb to the disease. It's just from what I've know, observed. How could we get it to come back? It's hard to say because uh, the disease is still, in the, is still in the environment unless you can develop a strain that's resistant. But um, I'm not, I, th I think there has been research done in the United States in, in developing a resi resistant strain, but uh, yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure. You can, we still plant it, you can still plant it and it'll grow and it'll seed, it'll grow to maturity, it'll go to seed, and you can still have it continue on, but it just, it won't, they won't reach the size that they used to, you know, like 10 foot across on the trunk and things like that. No. I don't think that'll happen again unless they develop their own resistance over, you know, over time. I don't know if that answers your, <laughs> answers your question. What, what do you think about growing hemp 
And would it benefit the soil at all? Growing hemp? Yes. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure, not too familiar with that method. Like, the one, one of the things that affects the river and the lakes here is, is, as far as agriculture, is the nutrients. And the main one is phosphorus. So there's something called a, a limiting nutrient. And so um, the limiting nutrient on land is nitrogen. And the limiting nutrient in water is phosphorus. And so when the phosphorus gets in the, into the waterways, it, it causes the algae to bloom and to proliferate. And when the algae dies, it sinks and the bacteria start to break it down. And the bacteria use oxygen out of the water. They pull the oxygen out so they can cause um, like a hypoxic state of the water and it causes fish die-offs and things like that. So if it's, if it's using high quantities of phosphorus that's escaping and getting into the, into the waterways, then it, you know, well, it would be like any other <laughs> farming industry right now. But um, if they can farm it and grow it and use um, methods that aren't, aren't going to allow the nutrients to escape off the land as much um, and make it more sustainable that way, um, then I guess it, it, it could be a good thing. Uh, you know, I only hear good things about about hemp uh, and its uses. So. Uh, you mentioned uh, the Grand River is improving in terms of its water quality. What about the Boston Creek and Mackenzie Creek? Are they fairly healthy? Could I drink from them <laughs> if I wanted to? <laughs> you can drink drink from wherever you you want. <laughs> um, I, I would say that they they could be better as far as habitat. Um, because I, I do see the f agricultural fields, fields draining directly into them. And again, that causes the algae to bloom and uh, causes the, the siltation from, from the, the soil. Um, it picks up toxins from that picture I showed earlier, <laughs> stuff like that. Um, and so the surface water, when it rains and it, and it collects, and it's called the non-point source pollution, so that it's not like coming from one specific area, it's coming from everywhere. And so when it comes from the ditches, from the car exhaust, it drains indirectly into the creeks. So they are impacted heavily um, in our community. But uh, from what I've seen, uh, as far as like biodiversity, um, they could be better, but they're not totally... Uh, <laughs> totally destroyed yet. Um, the, we've done a lot to change the, the flow of the water. So like I said, there's high flood periods and it causes a lot of erosion. But the, the stretch that goes through Six Nations has a lot of vegetation, so that sort of protects it. But even with that protection, you can still see the erosion, the erosion happening. So that indicates to me that there's a lot of water coming in and draining out really fast. And it's not being absorbed by wetlands or, or uh, or being absorbed by forests or as much as it could be. Because um, that picture, I had, that first picture I showed um, at the very beginning of Mackenzie Creek, it's kind of um, a good example, example of what happens naturally in, in any stream. So on the, on, the, on the left bank is sort of the erosion happening. Even though it's a natural bank, there's a lot of erosion occurring. But it's, it's settling on, on the opposite bank. That's called accretion. So it's accreting on, on the opposite bank. And so that's a natural erosion process. But um, even with that, that natural shoreline, it's still eroding a lot. So that tells me that there's a lot of energy going into the, the waterway, more than um, probably there originally was when there was more wetlands and swamps absorbing the, the surface runoff. So as we develop more area with concrete, that hard surface allows the water to run faster and faster into the waterways and um, so that, that flooding um, occurs faster and faster every time we, or as we develop more and, and have more hard surfaces for the water to run off of without capturing it first and letting it settle and uh, releasing it slowly. So they are, they're healthy but they, they could be better. What is, is there any species of plant or animal that's like very specific to our community? Or is it just sort of up and down Grand River? Um, <clears throat> good question. Not, 
that I know of. Um, whatever it grows here seems to grow. And there are things that grow in other places that don't grow here. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Some things I noticed, like um, spice bush, is, is a plant that we use that we, we cook it with deer meat. And I, I've been looking for years for spice bush. And I haven't been able to find it. I finally found it last year. One shrub growing. It's a woody shrub. And uh, when I was down in uh, Tonawanda um, two years ago, I seen it growing everywhere down there. And when I was asking some of the guys from there about it, they, they don't even use it for cooking. And so I think that um, if it was abundant here at one time, it isn't, any, isn't anymore because people have been harvesting it over the years for um, you know using for cooking and things like that. So it, it grows here still, but it's not abundant. Another one is um, like uh, uh, they call it um, wahoda or or a sweet flag. That's another used to be a common wetland plant around here that they use for medicine, and they use the root. Um, it's popular for men because the singers because they chew it and it, it clears your throat and it. Um, uh, for the guys who who sing a lot, so some of the old timers that used to sing a lot, they'd have a that root they carried around with them when they'd chew it, um, when when they go around to sing, to sing different places, and um, I think people have harvested that to a point where it's not common anymore. Another one is pepper root. It still grows like all these things still grow here, but they're not. If you go to a place where they don't harvest it, it's it's everywhere. <laughs> There's a lot of it. There's an, an abundance of it, but um, that's just something I noticed. Like. Not that it's a specific plant to here, but it's um, not as common as it might be in another, another place where it's not being used. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that's, I don't know if it's not really a bad thing, it's just uh, something I noticed. Yeah, well, like pepper root, it's, that's, it's only around here I'd ever heard that, that people use it or harvest it. You know, I'm sure they do elsewhere, but yeah. whenever you talk to anybody beyond this reserve, they never heard of it. Or... Yeah, yeah. Did yeah. you say pepper root again? Pepper root? Uh, I forget that one. <laughs> I have to ask. And um, I know you um, started earlier talking about medicines in the grasses and stuff. Is there, uh, do you still um, see like uh, that this community, is there still lots of medicines that are healthy and abundant and they're or a lot that are kind of going away, or we're still doing okay that way, or something we should also be thinking about and yeah, concerned I about? There's, <clears throat> I think a lot of people want to learn about medicine and, and they want to use it, but that knowledge is, just isn't what it used to be. And But one of the things that, that used to occur here in abundance was um, American ginseng and, and um, uh, um, what's the name? Uh, golden seal, things like that, were really abundant here at one time, and people used used it for medicine. And uh, not only our people, but um, other non-native people used it as well. And so it, it's been harvested to a point where it's not a common plant anymore, and it's um, sort of rare now. So that that's been happening, um, and. The overall, though, like the plants that um, that we use for medicine, like they say about what went cronio or those those grasses and stuff that are the leader is, is the red whip, um, and it's kainta uh, ka. It's the one that grows in the field, and those are still common here. Those are still growing strong, so their their leader is still there, and it's I guess that's a good thing, you know, um, and. Most of the medicine that I or plants that I see that are medicines are are doing fairly well, um, other than some of the ones that are not really tolerant of being uprooted, like the ginseng. You know, the ginseng roots are uprooted all the time and, and harvested for money. So that's why that's that one's disappeared. So, uh, so some are some have disappeared or or aren't here anymore, and some are still going strong. Um, a lot of them are still growing commonly, so yeah. it's hard to say for sure because you, you can't see every single inch of the reserve at, <laughs> at one time. But um, and there's places that things grow that people they won't tell you. Uh, they always tell you it doesn't grow in there. There's snakes there. Don't go over there or something. <laughs> Stuff like that. <laughs>
Okay, unless there's any last questions. Well, now I, Gerdo, for um, teaching us a whole lot tonight and a few things about yourself we didn't really want to know, but we found out <laughs> anyway. Um, but uh, everybody give a big hand for Gerdo. Yeah. Right on there. So um, I guess before uh, we close up, I'll make a few closing remarks since you didn't hear my first remarks, and I can't remember what I said then, so I'll do my best to recap. But uh, we just want to continue having these sorts of events. Well, we will continue having these events here at Polytech to keep the discussion going on all sorts of um, topics. We want to center this year around language, land, and art. And as you can see, and as you probably know, every, I don't have to convince anybody here that a lot of these things are interconnected anyway. Our languages inform our understanding of the land and the environment and how we express those things in our, in our culture, in our ceremonies, and in our art. All the stuff is, is uh, intertwined, right, in, in our philosophies. In the same way with this community and our, um, um, our relationships with each other and our families and our neighbors and our nations and our clans and even the surrounding non-Indigenous communities because the things that impact us in terms of the environment impact all of our neighbors as well. And uh, I think it's up to us to lead the way in, in holding them accountable and responsible, thinking about um, the things that we all need to do to ensure the preservation and survival of this very beautiful part of the world in which we live. And it's no surprise, you know, when we came here in 1784, 1785, I guess, that, uh, you know, we secured that land grant along this river. That was very important um, to our people at the time because that's how people survive. You know, back in New York State where we're from, the Genesee River, the Mohawk River, all of those uh, waterways and lakes were, were uh, fundamental to our uh, survival and our existence, and we, we still think about those things. So when we had to move from there, we... Uh, made sure that we were located along a waterway that could provide that in a much smaller form, but it was still important to us. And I think um, it's unfortunate, like Gerdo says, you know, that uh, a lot of our people have lost touch with that river because we don't in interact with it every day. We don't really have to, you know. Um, but I think it's something that we could all think about a little bit more. So anyway, you know, this is the kind of thing that we want to do on a more regular basis and keep these discussions alive. It's not just about academics and, um, you know, schoolwork. It's also about just having conversations like this and, and asking uh, our community members about the things that they know and, and share and all of the things that, uh, you know, uh, we're interested in. And I think that's what uh, really makes this series come alive. So I want to thank Stevie for doing all the work to organize and, and um, the cooks and caterers for the really fancy Friday night spread, boy. Uh, and uh, Shane and Gary for for recording this all, and to all, all y'all for coming out tonight on a Friday night. Um, you know, there's lots of things you could be doing this evening, but you chose to spend the night with us. Uh, so anyway, I guess with that then, we'll ask uh, uh, Gayaletto to close for us. <laughs>